Okay. Um, here's what you need to know about me. Um, I like Max. I'm a uh, Disney fanatic. In fact, I have I have Oswald the Lucky Rabbit right behind me. Uh, if you're a Disney fanatic too, you know that Oswald was lost to Disney for many, many years. Universal actually owned him. And in a, an interesting trade, Disney traded um, one of their sportscasters for Oswald. And that's how they got Oswald back again. It's actually a pretty interesting story. Um, and I really enjoy finding little tips and tricks that make my life on the Mac easier. And so this is the story of some of those tricks. Let's start with my favorite thing about Spotlight. <laughs> this is how old I am on the Mac. Remember when Spotlight first came out? Uh, it was um, it, it was amazing how how the Mac could just instantly know where anything that you wanted, anything that you were searching for was on your Mac. But if you all remember, the Spotlight window was not in the middle of your screen. It was in the top right. So here, here's one of my favorite features of Spotlight, that you can just take this and move it right back to that top right again, right where it belongs. Now, um, that's a little bit of a joke, but I do keep my Spotlight up in the top right corner because I'm so used to it being up there. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna put it back in the middle of the screen. But the nice thing is you can drag this and put it anywhere on the screen that you want to. Now, one thing I learned as I was getting ready for this presentation is that Big Sur has made a few changes to Spotlight in the way that it works. Like some of the other changes that Apple has brought to Big Sur, I don't mean this to sound like a bad thing, but some things are taking an extra step or two, whereas in the past it was you know, you know one step. In Spotlight, I realized in Big Sur, uh, it now takes a couple steps to do things. So I'll point that out when we get to it. Okay, so the number one thing I use Spotlight for is an app launcher. I'm sure many of you do too. If I wanna launch an app, um, I'll just use uh, Pages as an example. Um, that's the first thing in, this, in the Spotlight search results. So when I want to launch an app, I don't necessarily go to our little friend down here. In fact, I don't even keep this guy. I don't even keep Launchpad on my dock. This is on there because this is a, a new account on my Mac. But I don't use Launchpad. I do sometimes use the applications window that I put over here on my dock, and I set it up in a grid so I can quickly get to my apps. But if I know what I'm looking for, I very often just use Spotlight to pull it up. So an app launcher is number one. Number two, calculations. Anyone else? Anyone? Raise, raise your hand. Anyone else miss the dashboard? Anyone? Anyone? I don't see any hands going up. I miss the dashboard. I love the dashboard. I love the dashboard almost as much as I love Spotlight. Um, and one of the things I used in, in dashboard all the time was the calculator. All the time. And so it's nice to know that Spotlight will do those simple calculations for me. And, and you can do more complex ca calculations, but it'll do the simple calculations for you too. Uh, you know, 67 divided by five, that type of thing. And you get the result right in not only the, the Spotlight search bar, but in the first line of results here. Uh, of course, you can do the obligatory two plus two, but you can also do things like, you know, three, to the, uh, oh, no, oh, there we go, three squared. You can do that sort of thing too. Now, if I wanna do more complex calculations, I actually use an app called pCalc. And the reason I use pCalc is because it has a menu bar app. And so I can set up that menu bar app with a single keystroke, fire up pCalc and use it very much like I use the calculator in the dashboard. Okay, definitions are another thing you can use uh, in Spotlight. I don't have any particular word in mind, but we'll go with um, presentation. In fact, let's do this, let's do define presentation. And uh, 
you see it auto completes as well, which is nice. But here's the example of where it now takes two steps in Big Sur to get the result. In previous versions of Mac OS, it would actually show the result in the right hand side of the spotlight window as the results were coming up. Uh, with Big Sur, you see that it starts to give the definition there. But if I want to see the full definition, I have to hit the tab key to pull up the definition on the right. But it's still handy enough that if I want to look up a quick word or if I want to use the thesaurus, if it's available, to find an alternate an alternate to a word I'm, I'm looking to use, uh, I can pull that up in Spotlight really quickly. Currency conversions. That's another thing I miss from the dashboard. I use the converter in the dashboard all the time. And you'll probably notice that a lot of these things that I'm, I'm showing in Spotlight are things that I used to do, I personally used to do with uh, the dashboard. So whether it's conversions or whether it's definitions or calculations, those are all things I used dashboard for all the time. So now I'm trying to force myself to use Spotlight for more of these things. Um, and currency conversions are one of those things I use it for. So I can type in 12 USD. In fact, even 12 US does it, you can see. But if I type in 12 USD, the first result is 9.96 euros. Now, again, if I hit the tab key, I'll get not only 9.96 euros, but I'll get British pounds, Japanese yen, Canadian dollars, and Swiss francs, which is really nice. Now you can also do the reverse if I want to. I could do 12 euros, and I'll get 14.45 US dollars. And again, I can hit tab, and I can convert those 12 euros to pounds, yen, Canadian dollars, or francs. Hit the escape key to clear that out and temperature conversions. Now, a lot of these things, currency conversions, temperature conversions, things like that, they go back. Uh, one of one of the uh, former regular co hosts of my podcast is based in England. So it was often handy to know what the British pound was going for or what temperature it was um, where, where he lives, you know, things like that. But if I type in 12F, I see that's minus 11.11 11 degrees centigrade. And again, I can hit tab. And if you're into Kelvins, you can see that's 262.04 Kelvins. And just like with currency conversions, you can do the reverse. Okay, other conversions you can do. Handy inches to centimeters, yards to inches, kilometers to miles, those kind of things. So I can do 50 miles and I'll get 80.47 kilometers. And again, I can hit tab and it'll pull up a number of different common conversions for that 50 miles, meters, yards, feet, and inches. And just like with the other conversions, you can reverse that. You can do 50 inches and get how many yards that is, or feet, or things like that. Weather, another thing that I used to do in dashboard all the time. So let's say I want to know what the weather is. Well, if I just type in weather, what it's going to do, oh, this is from my playing around earlier. I wanted to see if it would pull up weather in Silicon Valley. It, it, it doesn't. Um, but it does show me weather in Lake in the Hills, which is close enough to where I am right now. I'm not actually in Lake in the, in the Hills, but that's close close to where I am. And if I just type in weather by itself, you see that the number one search result is Lake in the Hills, Illinois. And if I hit the tab key, I'll get weather over the course of the next few hours, as well as the upcoming days. And yes, it really is 39 degrees and we're under a freeze warning tonight. Um, weather in Chicago. I can pull that up as well. See it's warmer, lake effect. And I can also pull up weather in San Jose. It likes San Jose, but it keeps wanting to complete it to San Jose, Illinois. I didn't even know San Jose, Illinois existed, but thank you Spotlight, now I do. But I can pull up San Jose, California, and I can see that you guys are 60 degrees. You're gonna have a very nice week coming up actually. 
which is nice. Look up contacts. Now we're getting to the, the meat of spotlight, looking up contacts. Now, this goes back to Robert's question of whether I have any sensitive information. These are all fake contacts. I do not have any real contacts in my Mac. I actually uh, randomly generated these names. It's a list of 20 or so names that are in my contacts. One of them amazingly happens to be named Potter, uh, but it's an Amy Potter. I don't know an Amy Potter, but if I type in Potter, the number one search result is said Amy, hit tab, and I can pull up more information about Amy Potter. Um, if I had more information in there, of course, it would all show up in there as well. Now, I mentioned an app launcher. This is probably one of the things I use Spotlight for the most, but I did want to show you that you can use abbreviations in it. So in addition to typing in Word, which you can see the number one search result is Microsoft Word, I can also type in MW, and it also pulls up Microsoft Word. Likewise, you can do FCP, Final Cut Pro. I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head. GB, GarageBand comes up too. Now, some abbreviations don't work. I tried ME earlier. Where's Microsoft Excel? It's not there. Cisco WebEx Meetings comes up, Messages comes up, but Microsoft Excel doesn't. So I, I was curious, how far do I have to go to get Microsoft Excel to come up? M, E, X, no, M space E. Ah, number two, it comes up. This goes back to what I normally do, just type in the name of the app. The more I type in, of course, the closer or more accurate the results are going to be. By the time I got to EXC, it was ready to launch Microsoft Excel. But abbreviations do work for a, a wide variety of apps. So if there is an app that you do use frequently and an abbreviation works for, for you, that's a quicker way to launch that app. Oh, here's a cool one. Not me drinking a sip of water, that's not quite so cool. But here's a cool one. I like this. You can do natural language searching in Spotlight. And here is probably one of the more common things I do. I work with photos a lot on my Mac, personal photos. I'm not a professional photographer, but I work with personal photos all the time. So here's something neat you can do. Photos from 2016. And you can see in the search results here, all these photos are dated 2016. Now, again, keep in mind, this is not my real account, so I kind of preloaded it for this, but I do have photos from 2016 and 2019 in here. And you can see that it pulls those up, which is pretty cool. I like that. But you can also do cool things. Now, this won't be quite so handy in this account, but you can do things like photos from last week. And it will pull up pictures from the last week. I don't have any that match that in this account. Okay, one of the things that you may have noticed or you may notice in Spotlight on your Mac is that it keeps wanting to give Siri suggestions in the top, which can sometimes get in the way. Typically in my account, I have those turned off. So I wanted to show you how you can turn on or off different Spotlight search results um, from your system preferences. Now this, you very likely did cover in your talk the other day, but I'm I just wanna show you that real quick. If we go into system preferences on the Mac here and go into Spotlight, you can see that there's a number of things that Spotlight can return you can also tell it what not to search. You can uh, uh, drag folders into the privacy tab and tell it don't ever search this folder. But under search results, if I do not want Spotlight to return series suggestions, which is about the only thing I ever don't want it to return, I can just uncheck that box. Now, I will say one thing I missed the most from previous versions of Mac OS, or I guess I should say OS 10, because this is when those, those existed, is you used to be able to reorder the Spotlight search results. The Spotlight has gotten better over the years. It's gotten more accurate. So that feature has gone away. You can no longer reorder these, uh, but you can turn things off. If you don't want to have PDF documents returned, 
You don't want to have uh, spreadsheets returned, calculator results returned, conversions returned. You can turn those off. But the, the number one thing I almost always turn off is series suggestions in Spotlight. So that's it. That's all I wanted to cover on Spotlight. It's one of my favorite features of the Mac. I love uh, using it. I use it as an app launcher. I use it for conversions. I use it for uh, looking up words and definitions and weather results. And primarily, I started using it for all those things when Dashboard went away a couple Mac OS versions ago. Um, but it's such a powerful tool that if you don't use it that much, I definitely encourage you to investigate it further and see what all it can do for you. All right. So that's Spotlight. Next in my little bag of tricks, some of you will know this already, but uh, this is a new account, as I mentioned, on my Mac. And up here on my menu bar, uh, there's a number of apps and, and system settings and things like that. And in my primary account, these are in a particular order. I like them to be in that order. And they're not quite in the order I would like them in right at the moment. So if uh, you did not know this, you can press and hold the command key on your keyboard and you can rearrange these. Now I want little Ipsum over here. I want Bluetooth over here by wireless. Um, I can move Spotlight. I like Spotlight over on the right but in Big Sur, you can't go any further past Siri and the date and time and our little control center. So that's as far as we can go in Big Sur. So if I wanted Spotlight to be in that top right corner, you can no longer put, put it there in the top right corner. This is as far over as it can go. I hope you can all see this. It's at the top of my screen. Um, but you can rearrange some, some of these other things. So if I wanted the battery over here next to the users, or if I wanted, uh, this is actually for a Logitech uh, presentation remote. Uh, if I wanted that, uh, oh, let's say put it next to my, my volume, I can do that by just holding down the command key and rearranging them. Okay. I'm gonna fire up my web browser here. I happen to use Firefox on the Mac, and we have your website up on my screen. Now, one of my other favorite tricks, I use this all the time, is text snippets. Now, if you're not familiar with what text snippets are, it's when you are in an application, and in this case, I'm going to use the web browser. It does work in many different applications on the Mac. And let's say I wanted to remember or take note of this top paragraph from your website. I wanted to remember and, and store on my Mac this information about Silicon Valley Mac user group being one of the most long running groups, or yeah, most long running groups for persons interested in the Macintosh computer. Well, that's me. So I highlighted this paragraph. And now with that highlighted, I can click and drag and create a text snippet on my desktop that I can access anytime I want to, which of course is also searchable by Spotlight. So you can create little text snippets of, um, here's what I use it for the most. I use it for when I purchase software from a <coughs> third-party developer and uh, they display the serial number or license key on screen along with some other information about that app that I just purchased, I will highlight that on my screen and drag it to my desktop to create or capture that information that they're presenting on screen. Yeah, sometimes I get it in an email, sometimes I don't, sometimes I lose those e emails. So by creating a text snippet, I've got it on my Mac and then if you do use an app like one password where you can attach to your one password entries, you can attach files to it. I will sometimes attach that text snippet to the one password entry. Um, the other thing I use it for is for two factor authentication. If you've ever set up two, two factor authentication and they give you that list of nine or 12 rescue keys that you can use if you, if you can't 
for whatever reason, use the Authenticator app on your phone or you can't otherwise uh, get the text message, you get these little, little rescue keys. I will highlight them and create a text snippet and then attach that text snippet to the one password entry for that website or that service where I have two-factor authentication turned on. So text snippets can actually be uh, very handy. And once you have this text snippet, you can actually come in and you can highlight stuff and you can copy it and you paste it and you can, you can do stuff with that text, except edit it. This is a text snippet that's intended to represent the text that you captured. So it's not really an editable thing, but you can copy it and you can paste it into a text editor if you wanna play around with it later. But text snippets are, uh, in my book, a very handy thing. Uh, and uh, let's say I wanted to capture this other paragraph, I can drag and drop that to the desktop as well. Of course, I can capture a whole gob of text and uh, say the text snippet of that as well. But text snippets, if you have not used them, are pretty handy. All right, so I set up a scenario that's very common on my Macs. I don't know how common this is on your Mac. Sometimes I get a little too organized with things. So I set up a folder structure in this account that's very similar to the folder structures I use in my primary account. In uh, my documents folder here, I've created a folder called client stuff. And yes, I actually have a folder called client stuff in, in my account. So I have a folder called client stuff. And in there I have a list of my, my clients that I work with. And in this case, I have a folder for, for you. Inside that folder, I have another folder called projects. Yes, I really do this. And then inside projects, I have a list of the various projects I work on for said client. Now, um, it may seem complicated, but that actually works really well for me, especially when a client does call me and they, they have a question about something I've worked on for them in the past. I can go straight to the folder that contains everything about that project and look up information for them very quickly. Um, so in this case, I have an April 2021 presentation and I have two folders inside there, files go here and pictures go here. Now there's not actually anything in those folders, but that is very similar to a folder structure that I will use on my Mac. And you can see if I hold command and click the title of this folder, I can get the path that leads me to where I'm at right now. My MacBook Pro 13, Macintosh HD, users, Mac stock. That's the demo account. Documents, client stuff, SVMUG projects, April 2021 presentation. That's where we're at. Okay. That's the setup. All right. Now, we're working on a text document. There we go. This is the text document I was working on. And I want to save this text document in that folder. I want it in this folder right here. Files go here. That's where I want this document. So, brand new, never been saved. That's some lovely lorem ipsum text that I actually inserted from this app that's in my menu bar that I was rearranging earlier called Little Ipsum. When you click that icon, it will copy words, sentences, and paragraphs. And I just told it to copy four paragraphs that I inserted into this document. Little Ipsum's great. Um, but let's get back to the task at hand. I'm going to click File and Save, or Command S. Now, it wants to save to my desktop, but I want it there. I want it there. I don't want it here. So I could go to Documents. I could go to client stuff. I could go to your folder. I could go to projects. It takes a little while to do all that. I've got the folder open behind here where I want it to be. So I'm gonna use one of my other tricks. And I'll be honest, this is one I forget about all the time until I do this presentation. I'm like, that's right. That is a cool trick. Why don't I ever use this thing? But you see the folder behind it, the finder folder behind this window? 
I can hold down command and I can move it behind that window. Okay. Now, why did I do that? By the way, this is this is, you can do this with any folder that's in the background. So now, if I hold down command, I can move that one behind there. I can move this one. Whichever one your cursor's over, as long as you're holding command, you can move the window that's in the background. That's so cool. All right. Back to the task at hand. I want to save this document in that folder where it says files go here. Okay. You see, now this is this is Big Sur. Uh, if you're running an older version of Mac OS, the folder will be there. But if you see, if I hover over files go here, you see that little folder that shows up there next to it? Right there. I can click and hold on that folder and drag it to this file save di uh, dialog box. And it takes me right to where I want to be. I drag that folder to here. It takes me right to that folder. I can give the file a name. Cool doc. Cool doc. And click save. And there it is. So that was a twofer. One, hold down command and you can move the window in the background around. And two, rather than drilling down through all those folders in the file save or file open dialog box, it works in both. You can drag that if that window is already open, if you already know where it is, you can drag that little folder icon to the file open or save dialog and it'll take you straight to where you need to be. I love that one. I do that all the time. I kid you not, every day with that kind of folder structure, with the kind of folder structure I have for, for all my documents, you can imagine I use it all the time. But on, on my desktop Mac, which is over here to my right, uh, or on my Mac at the office, um, the, the, it's the, the Mac at the office is a 27 inch iMac. Uh, so I have enough room to leave windows open all the time on it. And then this is a 24 inch screen connected to my older Mac over here on my right. And um, I have windows open all the time. Uh, I kind of stack my finder windows uh, so that different projects I'm actively working on are, are open. And so I have ready access to those files while my browser window is open or while something I'm working on is open. Um, and so I use this trick of dragging that little folder icon to where I want to save or open files and uh, works really well. Of course, opening, you can always double click the file if you know where it is and that'll take you straight to it. But for saving, it's invaluable in my book. Ooh, related to that, related to that. Um, this is a test website that I, I, when I wanna play around with stuff for, for clients who, who need me to do stuff with their website, um, I will do it in this site here that's called Escape Workshop. And uh, I'm gonna use it for this presentation as well. So this is a WordPress site and it's not uncommon with a WordPress site to add or install new plugins into WordPress. Now, just keep in mind that what I'm going to show you can be done in many different websites, many different applications. I primarily do this with websites but if I wanted to install a new plugin on this site, you say there's a button up here, upload plugin, and that gives us this browse button. Now you could click browse and you could go to where the file is stored that you want to upload to this site. But the other thing you can do is drag your file that you want to upload straight to that browse button. So rather than actually clicking browse, I just drag the file to that button it tells the browser where that file is that I, I wanna upload to the site, and then I can go ahead and install it. So that's related to the other tip. You can drag and drop files into your browser, into the browse buttons, rather than click the browse button. So if you're filling out a form, 
need to upload your resume, need to upload a file to a website, just drag that file to the browse button rather than clicking browse and drilling down through all your finder windows. Ooh, here's a fun one. Here's a fun one. Can't do it with that file. So there is a neat text feature on the Mac called Summarize. If you've never turned on Summarize, this is definitely worth turning on. And I'll show you how to turn it on, but first I'm gonna show you how to use it. Now, Summarize is a neat feature on the Mac where you can select some text and it's a service. It's a service that runs on your Mac. And you can go to the service Summarize and tell it to give you a shorter summarized version of the text that you have highlighted. So I got this clever idea to summarize War and Peace for you guys, but um, it it didn't work. Uh, not only is that such heavy, difficult to slog through text in the first place, but it's just way too long to uh, work properly with, with summarize. But I do have chapter one. War and Peace, chapter one. All right, downloaded from Project Gutenberg. So, um, Summarize is a neat feature where it can summarize this text that I have on screen by either sentences or paragraphs, and you can get a short summarization or a longer summarization. This is kind of a facetious example, but I'm gonna show you how it works with War and Peace, and then I'm gonna show you how it works with some more real world text. All right, so let's go ahead and select all the text in chapter one of War and Peace. And Summarize installs itself as a service in uh, different apps on your Mac, just like I have different services in here, like uh, I could open up a new BB Edit document with, this, with the selected text, or I could convert that text I, I, to traditional Chinese. Now, see, I didn't set that up. That's just something that's built into Mac OS. That's interesting. Um, I could send it to Fantastical if I wanted to. These are all different services. I could, I could show it in the Finder. I could open it. I could make a sticky note, those kind of things. But I want to summarize it. So I'm going to click Summarize. And it's going to take that text I highlighted, and it's going to put it into the Summary window. Let's make that a little bit larger here. And you can see it's already summarized a bit. And it's, it's summarized by sentences. Now, in the case of a book chapter, that's not terribly useful. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to click to paragraphs. You can see the summarization changed. And I'm going to shorten or make it a, a shorter summarization of the text from chapter one. Now, someone who's intimately familiar with War and Peace might say, now, Mike, you're losing the context of the story by doing that. And yes, I am. That's true. That's why I'm going to show you a real world example in just a moment. Um, but you can see how it took this long chapter and created a nice little, well, I can't say Cliff's Notes. That's, that's a trademark. But it created this, this wonderful little summarization of chapter one. How accurate is it? Well, I, I would argue you're probably not getting the full gist of this chapter by doing this, but it gives you a nice idea. It gives you a nice idea for what's going on. So let's get to that real world example. That's how it works. You, you can choose to summarize by sentences or paragraphs, and you can opt to make a very short summarization or a longer summarization, the longest being 100%, which is all the text. By default, I think it's somewhere right around there. Okay, real world example. Let's go back to your website and let's take these four paragraphs. And let's summarize those. And I hope you can all see this.
going to select the text. You know what? Zoom in a little bit. All right. I don't know that I can zoom in on the summarization, but let's go into summarize. And let's go by paragraphs and let's make a very short summarization. Now, now here in this real world example, you can kind of see what it's doing. As we shorten the summarization, it's, it, it, if you read this, you can see it's actually cutting out the least important information. So the first paragraph it cuts out is the paragraph that says, please check the information announcements for information updates will also be posted on our mailing list. Look under the contact join tab for information on the mailing list. That would arguably, now for the person who wrote this, I apologize, but that would arguably be the least important bit of information of these four paragraphs. And as I summarize it, that's the first thing to go. And as I continue to summarize it, the last paragraph, the meetings are public during the period of COVID, da, 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 that gets cut off. And now we're left with the opening paragraph that describes who you are and when you meet as the second paragraph. And we can summarize even further and it takes it down to the first paragraph. Now, we might play with that in a case where you actually need to summarize information. And I do use this in real world situations you might switch to the sentence summarization and see if what you get is more accurate to the message you're trying to convey. But this is one of those features I actually do use in real life. Sometimes I need to take some information from, I sit on a couple different boards, board of directors. I need to take some information that was disseminated through that through a board meeting and and shorten it up for sending out through email or sending out on Twitter or something like that, I will sometimes use summarize to reduce that content down to just its essence. And it does a very good job of it. Now, if you do not have summarize in your services menu, here's how you turn it on. It's in your system preferences. Oh, by the way, I summarized it and it and asked me if I want to save it. I'm not going to save that, but you do have the option to save it out as the, as the summarized version. To turn this on, if you don't have it on, it's in your system preferences. It's under keyboard. We're going to go in here twice during our uh, talk here. It's under keyboard and then it's under shortcuts. It's under services. And you see there's a number of different services in here. Many are on, some are not on. This one happens to be under the text service. Scroll down here and there's summarize right there. And you can see I do have it checked. If I want to turn it off, I can uncheck it or turn it back on again. So that is how you turn on the summarize service. And I would encourage you to play with some of these other services in here. If you see something in here that looks like it would be useful, turn it on. And if you use it all the time, that's fantastic. That's what they're there for. They're there for you to take advantage of them. And Summarize is one that I use, uh, I find useful, and um, it's definitely worth turning on every time I set up a new Mac. Okay, how are we doing on time, guys? We're good, right? We got a little bit more time? Okay. War and peace. Okay. I've never read that. Being an English major, you think I would have read it. I never did. Okay. Here's a fun one. If you do not already use these, um, smart folders in the Finder. So I have two real world examples here. Again, I'm going to work with photos. That was the easiest thing for me to, to get over here for, for our uh, sample purposes. Uh, I'm going to set up two 
smart folders. We do that by going into a smart, a smart folder is a search. It's a folder that contains a search for something on your Mac. And in my case, I'm going to search for photos that match a particular criteria. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go to the file menu and go to new smart folder. And that is going to open up a search, a search. And I can, I can tell it where I want to search. By default, it's going to go to the desktop. Unless you already have a finder window open, it's going to default to that finder window. But I'm going to tell this new smart folder, as I'm setting it up, I want to search the Mac. Okay. And I am going to search for images. Now, we, we instantly we get results. These are all the images that are on this account on the Mac. Um, and I'm and, and our, our other criteria over here, we're searching for kind that's an image. Our other criteria is a particular type of image, JPEGs, TIFFs, GIFs. Yes, and, and GIF is correct, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. PNG, bitmaps, or uh, the new high efficiency uh, codec images. You can you can specify the type of image you're searching for, but I'm going to just leave it for all. I'm just going to leave it for all. And I'm going to, um, what I want to do is I want to search for images that either, remember I said I'm a Disney fanatic and an Apple fanatic, I'm going to search for images that either have the word Apple in the name or Disney in the name. Okay. So, normally, if I click plus to add another bit of criteria, I can say name contains Apple. Okay, great. There's four images that match that. What if I want to find images that also have Disney in the name? There's a little trick. And as you can imagine, You've been using the Mac long enough, as you can imagine, that trick involves the option key. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to delete this line, name contains Apple, I'm gonna go ahead and click the minus to remove that. And I'm gonna hold down the option key while I click plus. And you can see what happens is it adds this extra line in here. And I can choose to search any of the criteria, that's an or type search. I can search all of the criteria that I'm about to give it, which would be an and search. Or I could do none of the criteria I'm about to give it, which would be a uh, nor. And or nor. None of this. None of these things. So um, let's start with any, because that's exactly what I do. I want to find files that have Disney or Apple in the name. So any of the following is going to be true. Name contains Apple. Let's go back to that. Now I can click plus and name contains Disney. You can see my search results expand to include not only images that have Apple in the name, but images that have Disney in the name. So we went from a search result of four to a search result of seven. Now I can continue to add criteria to this, but this matches what I wanted to do. I wanted to find images on the Mac that have um, of any image type that have either Apple or Disney in the name. If I were to change this to all of the criteria, I would get nothing because there are no images that contain Apple and Disney in the name. And if I were to search none, where none of the following are true, I would get every other image on the Mac except for those that have Apple or Disney in the name but I want the ones that have Apple or Disney. So I'm gonna say any of the following are going to be true. The name contains Apple, name contains Disney. Now, excuse me, I'm gonna click save. Now, 
I'm going to save this to my desktop. I want this smart folder to be readily accessible to me. So I'm going to save it on my desktop. And if I wanted to, I could add it to my sidebar. I could add it to the sidebar of the finder. So it's always there, no matter what finder window I had open, there's the smart search. I'm not going to do that in this case, but I'm going to do uh, Diz Apple stuff. I like stuff. Diz Apple stuff. Save. All right, there's my there's my folder. Diz Apple stuff. Okay. Any files, any images I add to my Mac that have either Apple or Disney in the name will show up in this folder. Now and you can see I have seven in there. Now, if I were to uh, bounce to my pictures folder and let's go into Disney here and let's change one of these. Instead of Disneyland, I'm going to change it to Disneyland. D-I-Z. That, that changed the name of the file, but it also affects the smart folder search results. So go to the smart folder and I'm down to six items in there because that particular file no longer matches the criteria that I gave the smart folder. Change the name back and it will instantly appear in that folder again. And there it is. Okay. Now, I'm going to create one more smart folder. This one I'm going to go through a little bit more quickly. This Mac. This one's a little simpler. I'm going to just say uh, where the name contains IMG, IMG underscore. So these are all the, the photos. Now I didn't specify photos, I didn't specify images, but these IMG files come off my Canon camera. That's, what, that's how they're named, IMG underscore some number, some incremental number. Um, that's the search I'm going to do for this smart folder. I'm going to click save and I'm going to call it IMG files. And I'm going to save it to my desktop. And there we go. Okay. Now, the power of smart folders is that anytime I add a file to my Mac, no matter where I put it on my Mac, it will show up in here. You can also search by tags. You can search by uh, content. You can search by other file types. You can make the smart folder as powerful or as, in this, in this particular case, as weak <laughs> as you need it to be. Um, but in this case, I wanted to specifically search IMG files. There are 12 files in there. Now, we're gonna go on to my next tip. Let's just forget those smart folders exist for a moment. I'm gonna go into my pictures folder and I happen to have, that's the, the um, these are all pictures from Route 66 that it start with IMG underscore. My daughter and I took a trip from Chicago to Rancho Cucamonga, California, where my aunt and uncle lived and we followed Route 66 as, as best we could <laughs> all the way out. And that's what these pictures are. These are Route 66 pictures. Now, um, I also have some pictures in here from MaxDoc, but because it's kind of a, a whole little sidebar or rat hole as to why these are named this way, uh, but these files that came off the same said camera actually start underscore MG underscore. And it has to do with the color space. If you change the color space on a Canon camera, it puts this underscore at the beginning instead of I at the beginning. Um, that was one of those things I learned. I did not know. I couldn't figure out why my photos were coming out this way. And then I learned it was the color space change. Um, so I have these photos, these Mac stock photos from 2019 uh, on here. And I want to rename all these. And I could go through and name them one at a time. Or, here's the tip, you can select them. I can also Command-A, select them. 
and um, you can bulk rename them, which is pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> here's one of those setup things. Here's one of those setup things. I don't have secondary click turned on on my mouse. <laughs> I was like, why am I not right clicking? All right, there we go. Uh, I know I could have control clicked, but I'm so used to right clicking. Okay, um, now I can re I can bulk rename them. Here's the tip. I can add text to them. And it gives me a little a little example here. So these files are underscore mg underscore some number. I could add text to the beginning. I could add max doc to the beginning, or I could add it at the end. And you can see in the example what it's doing. It's adding it either directly to the end or directly to the beginning. I could replace text. Now, this is what I actually want to do. I want to replace underscore mg with img. That's what I'd like to do to get them a consistent name to how they're otherwise named on my Mac. That's replacing text. Or I can freeform format the name. So I can uh, format them with a name and index, a name and a counter, or a name and a date. I can apply that index after the name or before the name. So, for example, if I wanted to call these MaxDoc and um, have a name and index, and I start those numbers at 1001, you can see that in the example, they would all be called MaxDoc 1001, 1002, 3, 4, et cetera. Um, I could do name and counter, or I could do name and date. I actually find name and date to be the least useful if I'm being honest, but uh, name and index is a great way to go. But in my case, I actually want to replace text. So I'm going to go with what I said. I'm going to go with underscore MG and replace it with IMG rename and boom, they're all renamed. Let's go back to that smart folder. Bam, all the files, not only do I have these root 66 files in here, the 12 that were originally in there, but I now have the other 12 that were in the MaxDoc folder that I just renamed to include IMG at the beginning instead of underscore IMG. And that's the power of smart folders. So however you set up your smart folder, it will always instantly stay on top of any files you add to your Mac that match the criteria of that folder. Super powerful. As is the bulk rename. Bulk rename is one of those things that we used to uh, use one of those one trick pony apps for, you know, you go download an app that would allow you to bulk rename files on your Mac. Well, now it's just built right into Mac OS, uh, which is very, very cool. How are we doing guys? We got, we got time for a couple more. We have a question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing the chat window. I apologize. Um, does using a smart folder pluck files out of other folders? No, um, no, uh, are they instead uh, pointers or aliases to those folders or to the files or is it something else? That's an excellent question. It does not pull them out of the original folder. You can see I still have them in. This is my pictures folder. This is max stock samples. They're still here, even though they're showing up in the smart folder. Uh, these are the actual files. It's uh, think of it as search results. So this is the actual file. If I were to take this file and rename it, it would disappear from the smart folder and the original is renamed. If I were to delete a file that's in here, it would end up in the trash and would would in fact be removed from the original location. So I'm not sure if it, they're not aliases. They're not aliases. They are in effect pointers, if that helps you think of it better that way, but they really are the original files. 
So what you're playing with, what you see in the smart folder are your original files. So do be careful. Don't think of them as aliases. Don't think of them as alternate versions of those files. They are your files. So you delete them, you rename them. Anything you do to those files is going to affect the original. The best way I could say to think of it is a smart folder is simply search results. It's no different than using um, uh, a one-off search in the finder or using a spotlight search. Spotlight search or a one-off search in the finder, you're working with real files. The only real difference is a smart folder is not a one-off search. It's a search that's uh, in effect there perpetually for any time you need those particular search results at hand. Did I over explain that? <laughs> I probably did. Yeah, well, for programmers, uh, um, they get really persnickety and picky about that sort of stuff. And this really doesn't follow any of the rules programmers would expect. I expect it does not. Yes, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, it would be interesting if they were aliases. It would be interesting, but no, it, they, they are the actual files. It's just, it's just search results. It's just search results, but it's search results that are there at the ready for when you need that search. So if I wanted, uh, in this particular case, um, being a Disney and Apple fanatic, if I always wanted any photo that had Apple and Disney together in one spot, for me to, to find them quickly, I could create this smart search folder so that they're always there at the ready for me. Um, they're not virtual files. I did see that question pop up. They're not virtual files. They are the original files. If I were to delete this, let's go to, um, this is the original folder here. This is in my, you, you can see, we can follow the hierarchy here. Users, MaxDoc, Pictures, Apple, that's where I'm at here. And uh, here's the Apple Cube picture that's got Apple in the name, right? And here it is here in the Smart Search folder. If I delete that, it's gone from my original folder too. These are just, it's, this is just search results. Just search results. So these are the original files, not pointers, not virtual. They are the original files when you're working with uh, smart folders. That, that question got cut off. Can I see, did anyone see what that question was that popped up? Okay, so there's two possibles here. One is, uh, can I find where that file in the search folder actually is on my drives? Yep. If I right click it or control click it, show in enclosing folder. Yeah. Another possibility for the same thing is you can get info on that folder on that file and it will actually show the full path name to that spot. Absolutely. Smart folders are pretty awesome. I wish I remembered to use them more. You can make your own shortcut keys. I happen to use text edit a lot. I like text edit. Um, it's, it's nice. It's simple. It does what I need it to do. I don't need all the bells and whistles and pages and word and all that kind of stuff. So I use text edit a lot. And you may have even noticed that when I use text edit, I use it in plain text mode. I don't even, I, I'll go into BB edit once in a while when I need to use grep searches and things like that. But most of the time I use text edit. I, I like a nice, simple, plain text editor. Um, I do a lot of website work though, so that, that probably has something to do with it. Um, but once in a while, um, I need to do something in it and I gotta dig through the menus and I, I can't find it and, uh, oh, that's where it is, make uppercase. Okay, great, but it's in the menu. There's no handy little shortcut key next to it. There's no command X or shift command A or whatever next to make uppercase, but I, I want this text to be uppercase and I gotta always remember where it is, but I can remember, this is just how old I am and how my brain works, but I can remember keyboard shortcuts. So I'm gonna create my own keyboard shortcut for make uppercase in text edit. All right, so here's how we do it. We're going to go into 
It doesn't change the command in the menus, by the way. We're just adding a keyboard shortcut to it. So we're going to go into key, uh, System Preferences. Oh, i got to move your faces over here. Okay, and then we're going to go into uh, Keyboard. I told you we're going to go back in here. So it was it was prescient. Prescient? Prescient. Prescient. It, you foretold, you foretold that uh, by picking a practical tip, oh, never mind. Um, keyboard, shortcuts. This is where we were before when we did the services, right? But we're going to go into app shortcut. We're going to create an app shortcut for text edit here. We're going to go to uh, the plus. We're going to go to um, text edit. We, we could set up this keyboard shortcut for all apps, but this is a very specific one to text edit. So I'm going to go into text edit. Now, here's the trick. When you create a keyboard shortcut for an app, it has the menu title has to match the name that's in the menu. It has to, it must match it exactly. In fact, the Apple even tells you, enter the exact name of the menu command you want to add. Charles is talking about programmers. Edit, transformations, make uppercase. There's spaces in there, uppercase letters, make uppercase. Okay, so I'm going to go to make upper case. Bam. There. That's that's the, the menu item I want to add a keyboard shortcut to. Now here's the magic. The keyboard shortcut I want to set it up is um, Shift Command U. Shift Command U. All right. So Shift Command U, I'm attaching to the command make uppercase. I'm going to click add. All right, and now we can see under shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts for app shortcuts under text edit, make uppercase is shift command U. Now I go back over to text edit, I go to the edit menu, and you can see, oh look, now I have a keyboard shortcut there, shift command U, this is awesome. So if I want to make this entire paragraph uppercase, shift command U, and it's uppercase. There's your practical tip. Now I have to put two more marks in. Yeah, <laughs> and to drive it into the ground on that, if it happens to be something that invokes a dialog box, is it three dots on the end? Do you have to put those three dots in? And is it three dots or is it the one single special ellipsis character? Good, that is an excellent question. And I, oh, um, you mean like this, like rename? Dot, dot, dot. Shift, command, option, R. You have to put the ellipses in. Excellent question, Charles. I didn't know the answer to that. And it See, looks like you need the dot, dot, dot. Learned. Yep, you have to nope. put in dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. There you go. So move to actually move to would be a good example too. move to dot, dot, dot. So, yeah, it, it, when they say it needs to match exactly by gum, it needs to match exactly, doesn't it? So there you go. <laughs> I'm going to have to add that to my notes. Well, so there I, you go, my friends. So I didn't know there was a single ellipse keyboard stroke. Well, usually you will type dot 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 and it will automatically convert it to the single character ellipse if if, the, if, it's, if it's supported. Yep. Yeah. Um, I use, um, where is my little friend here? See, this is one of the things I keep in my menu bar. Um, oh, pop car. That's what I use to, to look up the keystrokes. Oops. Find characters. Now, see, that just found a period. Here. Hmm. Two L's. Oh. D. Thank you. There. They put in my little ellipsis right there. 
And the nice thing about PopCare, if you don't use it, is hovering over it, it tells you down at the bottom, it's option semicolon. Option semicolon is how you type that if it doesn't convert it for you. So option semicolon puts in your ellipsis. I do happen to know option dollar or option dollar sign or option four gives you the cent sign. I use that one fairly frequently. Option pound gives you the pound sign. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, depth keyboard shortcuts is somewhat limited, <laughs> and that's why I have pop care in there all the time. Well, you can uh, show keyboard, and then when you hold down the modifier keys, it will change the keyboard display to show you what's available. Absolutely. That's another great way to do it. Yep. Yep. That's another great <laughs> way to do it. If I had that turned on uh, for many, many years, and that's under input sources here, show input menu and menu bar. And uh, there you go. So there's your hold down option, hold down option shift, shift. Yeah, that's it. That's really handy.